Welcome to a unique journey to my second home, north to Alaska. Expect the unexpected. Some say Alaska will always change your plans. So we have an introduction, a time warp, the dateline, the border, the flag, lots of facts because Alaska is simply number one, amazing fakes, distances, a swim, a road or a railway to cross the Bering Street, Obama's islands give away, the ring of fire, the volcanoes, the bears, an unexpected danger into the wild, survival, strange laws and other facts, a big fish, the Iditarod, and finally, hard to believe but true. Let's take off. Frankfurt Anchorage non-stop in nine hours. This is your captain. We're preparing for landing at Anchorage, Ted Stevens Airport. You need to return to your seat, fasten your seat belt and put your seat in an upright position. The local time is 2 p.m. The temperature in Anchorage Airport is 25. We hope you had a pleasant journey and we wish you a great time in Alaska. Thanks for traveling with Ela Air and we hope to see you again. Alaska is also called the last frontier, the land of the midnight sun, or simply the great land, which is also carved in the quarter coin, the quarter dollar coin. The time warp and the theory of the Bering Land Bridge. It must be at least 40,000 years ago where this is at least the estimate. The Amerind migration group first arrived in Alaska. About 12,000 years ago, the second migration happened, where people from the Aleut Islands and Nadim also crossed the Bering Bridge. At least, this is the theory. In the 18th century, Bering cited the state Alaska on his voyage to Siberia. Spanish explorers also reached Alaska and claimed the region. The first official Russian colony was founded by hunters on Kodiak, which is the largest island. The Brits and the Spanish got in conflict over the area, but finally they reached an agreement to allow both to kind of use the area as a sailing passage. But Spanish subsequently withdrew from the area. Several places on the Alaska coast still have Spanish names. The British continued to explore the coast while the Hudson Bay Company set up fur trading posts at Fort Yukon. The Russian acquired a monopoly for fur trade in America but they never fully colonized Alaska. Over time, Russian influence weakened. In the 19th century, the Western Union laid a telegraph line from Russia to Alaska under the Bering Strait. In 1867, US purchased Alaska from Russia for 7.2 million in gold roughly two cents per acre, where the acre is 4,046 square meters. After that, Alaska was called the District of Alaska and thereafter Alaska Territory. At the end of the 19th century, the Klondike Gold Rush started near Dawson City, which is actually Canada, but a lot of people came through Alaska and the potatoes got such a high value because of their vitamins that miners traded them for gold. 
Then the Alaska gold rush came and over 100,000 hopeful gold miners arrived. Before we head into the 20th century, let's check some other facts. One impact of the purchase was that the dateline was moved. When Alaska still belonged to Russia, it was of course on the Eastern or Asia Pacific time zone, but on the 6th of October, they, the Julian calendar was the Asia time date, Alaska prepared to have another Friday, 6th of October, actually then transitioned into 18th of October because they changed the calendar and they also, which made 12 days and another day that was to kind of change to the other side of the time, date, date line, time zone. Another impact was that the border line parallel to the date line actually separated the two islands, the Diomede Islands, in the middle of the Bering Strait. So what used to be one nation before, now one, the big Diamond Island, became or remained with Russia and Little Diamond Island, now belonging to Alaska, these two had different nationalities. Another interesting fact is the population. When it was 1910, it was about 65,000. Nowadays, or in 2020, it is more than 10 times. Diamond is a unique place because of its location. There is about 140 people that dwell here. 98% native, they've been living here for years, most from generation after generation. The reason we live here is because uh, it's a home where we can hunt out in the sea. This is our coastline, right along here, it's 50 feet from where we're standing, right where, the, right where the boats are and right where the machine is. All out there is the Barren Sea, the Barren Straits. During the winter, we have planes that do land here on the ice runway. In order for us to have a runway here, the ice needs to be at least four feet thick and 2,000 feet long. The logistics on getting out there, sometimes they get an ice runway which allows planes to land. What are you doing here again? Go measure the ice thickness. For the planes? Yes.
Sasha. So going now to the 20th century, Canada and the U.S. settled the Alaska border dispute, which was ongoing since 1821. Officially, Alaska gained the Panhandle area, but this was just due to a vague wording about the territorial line in an old agreement between Russia and England. The most powerful volcano eruption happened then, and the, the valley of the 10,000 smokes resulted from this eruption. In 1942, Atu and Kiska, the Aleut Islands, were occupied by the Japanese during the World War, and its recovery became a matter of pride for the U.S. military. There's also the reason that the population grew because of the military bases. The Elkin, the highway from Alaska to Canada, was completed, starting near Alberta at the British Columbia border and running through Yukon to Alaska. 1959, on the 3rd of January, the 49th state was born. In 1964, the world's second strongest earthquake with 9.2 on the scale happened in Alaska and killed 133 people. In 1986, oil was found on Prudhoe Bay on the northern coast. The oil boom in Alaska was there. It is the biggest oil field in North America. From 1969 to 1977, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline was built and it took 77,000 workers to complete the project. It stretches over 800 miles or about 1,280 or 90 kilometers. And it goes from Prudhoe Bay all the way to Valdez. It has moved over 18 billion barrels of oil so far. In 1987, a historical swim with po political impact happened, and in 1989, more than 11 million gallons of oil spilled into the Prince William Sound, where the Exxon, Exxon Valdez hit a reef. The Alaska Highway, winding in and winding out, fills my mind with serious doubt as to whether the lout who planned this route was going to hell or coming out. Retired Sergeant Troy Hides, stationed at Summit Lake, Historical Mile 392. Although plans called for a 36-foot wide road to be built, the road averaged only 12 to 18 feet that first year. Cleared areas often became bogs, miring equipment like this D8 tractor called a swamp cat in the mud. Stretches of the road that were built over permafrost became impassable during spring thaw. Soldiers and civilian workers lay a corduroy road across one of the many boggy stretches of land on the Alcan. Sections of the Pioneer Road often opened to traffic only at night when the ground froze.
sub-zero winter temperatures were hard on both men and equipment, hampering road construction and making driving hazardous. Pontoon boats were used to transport equipment across lakes and rivers until bridges could be built. Most of the bridges built in 1942 along the Alcan were timber truss and timber trestle bridges. It wasn't until 1943 that permanent steel bridges were planned for all major streams along the highway. The Alaska Highway officially opened November 20th, 1942 with the ribbon cutting ceremony at Soldier Summit, mile 1061. With its road building mission completed, the 340th took up a new assignment, driving the Fairbanks freight, building permanent camps, and maintaining the road. In 1943, the Alaska Highway was upgraded for increased military traffic. The Alaska Highway was opened to the public in 1948, and the following year, the first edition of the Milepost appeared. Alaska flag actually also bears an interesting story. 1926, Government George Parks pursued it to hold a contest open to all Alaskan children grades 7 to 12 to design a flag for the state. By January 27, the contest rules were circulated to schools throughout the ter territory. The first stage was each town was to organize um, a panel of judges, sending only 10 of the best designs to Juno by 1st of March 1927, resulting in actually 142 designs. The contest winner was Benny Benson, a 7th grader on the Territorial School in Seward. By May 1927, the flag design was adopted by the two houses of the territory legislatures. On his design submission, Benny had also written some words of explanation. The blue field is for the Alaska sky and the forget-me-nots, an Alaska flower. The North Star is for the future of the state. the most northerly in the Union. The Dipper is for the great bear, symbolizing strength. In many areas, Alaska can simply be considered the number one. And this is not only the size, because if you look at it, you have four point uh, sorry, 1.481 million square kilometers, which is bigger than Texas, California, and Montana together. Also, you see that it is the most northern, western, and technically, actually also the most eastern state due to the Aleut islands extend to the Eastern Hemisphere. And Atu, which is um, the most, um, the last island of the Aleut chain, then this is more further west than Hawaii. Then also it is number one if you include the water area, because the water area itself is more than 14% of the country, of the state. It has the longest shoreline. It is longer than the rest of the U.S. shoreline together. It has the highest and the coldest peak, and 20 of the most highest peaks are up in Alaska of Northern America. There's volcanoes and earthquakes. There's lakes and rivers. There is the lowest density. There is the most bears and bush pilots and there's mushers and veggies. 
And if you consider Germany is just 350 square kilometers. Doesn't even make the size of Montana. Bearing in mind what we've just seen on the slide before, it is an amazing fake. If you look at the first top three images, where you just Google for a US map, and this is what you get. And Alaska looks actually on all of them smaller than Texas. There is not even a scale where they're considering that this is a different um, metrics. So if you would lay Alaska over Europe, you see this is reaching like from the far north Denmark all the way down to Cyprus, but also it extends towards the Atlantic Ocean. If we look at the planet from the north, you pretty clearly see the strategic position of Alaska. It's from a distance point of view, Moscow is 500 kilometers closer to Anchorage than Frankfurt is. Even the flight time might be a bit longer, but this is not the direct measures um, or direct straight way they're taking. Tokyo and New York has the same flight distance from Anchorage, which is amazing because most people wouldn't think or look at it that way. So clearly, this is a really strategic point. The story about the swim is a real unique one. And last August in 2022, it became 35 years when Lynn Cox did the swim to break the Cold War ice curtain. In 1987, she swam through the frigid waters of the Bering Strait from the United States to the Soviet Union. I wanted to open the border so we could become friends, Cox said back then. Who first conceived the idea of this swim in 1976 and spent years lobbying Soviet officials for permission to enter their waters? The difficulty was not that nobody believed in it, it, that nobody believed it could happen, not just the swimming in freezing water, but to bring an end to the Cold War. So after this was uh, um, always ignored, Cox finally decided to use all the money she had from her savings for the swim. On the eve of the swim, there was still no word from Moscow, and the military on both sides of the Cold War were nervous. At the last minute, the Soviet sent a top-level delegation, including the KGB um, and sports stars. A small beach party was prepared. The swim turned Cox into a Cold War celebrity in the US in, and in the Soviet Union. When President Gorbachev traveled to Washington at the same year to sign a nuclear weapon treaty, later, he said to President Reagan when they toasted that Cox actually proved by her courage how close to each other our people live. She was um, included into the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 2000. It was freezing cold and it just took my breath away. I knew that if I was going to make it, I had to go with all I had inside me. 
I got the idea of swimming the Bering Strait from my father. Uh, he had pulled out a map of the world and he said, you know, here's Alaska, here's Siberia. Why don't you think about swimming across the Bering Strait from Little Diomede on the American side to Big Diomede on the Soviet side? In a straight line, it's 2.7 miles, 4.3 kilometers. It was still the middle of the Cold War, and I was trying to make a political statement and promote peace between the two countries. So I started trying to figure out how to do it for 11 years. I did a lot of weightlifting. I did things that made me a lot stronger so I could swim faster. I finally got permission to swim the Bering Strait from the Soviets. When I jumped into the water in the Bering Strait, it was immediately freezing cold. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is so hard. How am I ever going to do it? But then I thought, this is what I've trained for. And I started swimming as fast as I could go. I knew that if I didn't swim fast, I'd go into hypothermia. The current was very strong. It was about two knots, and we were being pushed immediately north. The Inuits from Little Diamond were going to be my guides across the Bering Strait. They were looking at this old rusty compass and, and basically would make suddenly these corrections to the left. We were supposed to meet the Soviets at the halfway point, but there were there's no sign of a boat. And I started looking down at my hands and I could see that they were starting to become kind of a gray color. So I knew that I was really cold and so I started to try to swim faster because I felt like, you know, this is my biggest sprint that I've ever done and I just need to make it across. The fog started to lift and in the distance we could see the conical shape of, of Big Diomede Island and it was just like, oh my gosh, there's the Soviet Union. I got to within maybe 100 meters of the finish and there was a man yelling, you know, at the top of his lungs, I'm from Moscow. The welcoming committee could not meet you there where I'm about to land on shore. Can you swim to the snowbank down there? And I'm like, oh man, <laughs> I just really want to finish. The water's really cold and I'm really tired. It took about 30 more minutes to reach the snowbank. And there were three Soviet soldiers that grabbed my arm and then just pulled me out of the water. Um, and I could feel immediately the, the heat of their hands on my skin and thought, oh, they feel so good. <laughs> and I heard them speaking Russian and I thought, wow, we really made it. It's the best. It's more than I ever imagined. I mean, oh. to, to have them open their door and let us land on their shore to begin with, you know, having that support from the Soviets and having them help us get into shore and meeting us, it was wonderful. The Russian doctor kept lying on top of me to give me her body heat. Um, and so I just thought, wow, this is amazing. This person I don't even know from, from the Soviet Union, from a place where I'd always been afraid of, was lying on top of me to give me her body heat. Just felt like, oh my gosh, you know, it's no longer philosophies or differing ideas. It came down to just two human beings connecting. I think my swim helped improve relations between the two countries. Three months later or so, President Gorbachev stood up at the White House dinner and toasted the swim and said it showed how close to each other the two countries are and how the relations are improving. And I thought, oh my gosh, I had no idea that was going to happen, but that was exactly what I hoped the swim would do. Believe it or not, there are plans since long time to build a road or a railway to cross the Bering Strait. The first time this idea came up was in the middle of the 19th century. You think it was dropped? It wasn't. The last time it was discussed seriously in 2018. And I think maybe this is the construction that was kind of brought um, most forward and was discussed with all countries that are participating from it. But considering the current world situation, it is unlikely to happen. The idea was actually also to not um, ship all the goods from China around the world anymore and rather use the shortcut to the States and to Europe. If we would have this on a train, we could also be sure that we're not polluting the, the planet anymore because it could be 
economical. Hi, how you doing? I'm uh, Scott with the Intercontinental Railway. The Intercontinental Railway is a 5,500-mile uh, long railway that will link the existing uh, systems that are in North America through Canada into Alaska, and then a 70-mile-long tunnel under the Bering Strait to Russia and China. So really, this has the potential of being the Panama Canal of the 21st century. I hope to see that we are actually friends, not enemies. That we have much more in common than separate us. So it's important that Russia and the United States join each other and maintain the peace in the world. It's his dream, you know, but uh, it's a big headache for me. You know, he's promoting that for how many years? 30 years or whatever? I believe that if the, our presidents uh, will make a decision about the project, we can build it very fast. Personally, I would finish. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. Right, but George, you need to understand something. I am done with you. Pay it. Okay. For the project. I don't. This is difficult. years ago there was a fake news going around that Obama is giving away Alaska Islands. Actually this is not true. The internet is not always the source of truth but anyhow these islands were as part of the treaty not belonging to the US and they were never claimed because they were not part of the deal in the first place. Anyhow, there have been several amendments to the treaty from 1867, but there was never a question about who these islands belong to. Another interesting area is the Ring of Fire. It's the Pacific Ring of Fire, which actually um, is around a tectonic um, plate and there is lots of volcanoes and earthquakes around this area around the whole fire ring alaska is part of it and in march 1964 tectonic movements caused the second strongest earthquake ever measured that was 9.2 on the scale if you look at the snapshot of the March, 18th of March 23, 50% of all global earthquakes within one week happened in Alaska. So obviously this is not a safe place, is very active if it comes to earthquakes and volcanoes. As just mentioned, volcanoes and the volcano threat levels in Alaska. There is five which are considered as very high, 30 which are considered high, 51 as moderate low or very low. If you look at the location, three of the five are very close to Anchorage. 120 kilometers is the Mount Spore, 170 is Mount Redoubt and 390 is Mount Augustine. Depending on the winds, it can really mess up the air around the big city, but this is something people kind of learn to live with. There's not much you can do, it's Mother Nature and she's she always does what she wants. Bears, Charlie Vandergaard's Bear Haven. This is a unique story, but in general, there are about 100,000 black bears 
and 30,000 brown bears, including grizzlies and Kodiak bears, which means 98% of the American brown bears live in Alaska, and humans get rarely killed by bears. Usually bears don't group like in the picture below. This is only because Charlie has fed them over the years on his property, and one female even trusted him that far that she returned with her cup and nursed it there. There's an Australian channel where there is a short arm um, video about the story. We're gonna watch it. And at Kurt, um, Charlie had to make a statement because the law kind of caught him. The officials became aware of what he's doing on his property. Even this is outside the town and all, but it's not allowed to feed wildlife in Alaska. And there's also warnings that you should not even try or think about trying to run away from a bear because you will never make it. The bear is faster than a horse on a, on a short sprint, so you wouldn't have any chance. You can climb up a tree if it's a grizzly bear, but the black bear will obviously follow you because they do climb still, even when they're adults. And the polar bears also have some unique mark. Um, they have black skin. This is to absorb the sun and keep them warmer, let's say. Their, their fur or their hairs has actually um, air inside. So this is giving more isolation even. For years, Charlie shared his property with generations of bears. And aside from family and a few friends, the outside world was oblivious to the extraordinary relationship he developed with them. It was only recently that authorities found out about Charlie's secret life, and they were not happy. What he's doing is clearly illegal, um, and it's illegal because it's dangerous, and it's dangerous both to people and ultimately to bears. How much longer will your department tolerate what Charlie's doing? Well, if it was up to us, we wouldn't tolerate it any longer. But, you know, in Alaska, it's a little different in some places. Um, well, you'd, but you'd shut him down tomorrow, would you? The Alaska Department of Fish and Game would, yeah. Well, this bear, I'm standing here looking at it. It's just torn down a bird feeder. For wildlife officer Bruce Barkley, bears are the number one management issue in summer. Keeping them out of Alaskan suburbs is a nightmare. And feeding bears is strictly illegal. Charlie is viewed by officials as a rogue, teaching his bears very bad habits. Oh, oh, oh. oh get out. You think he's setting a bad example, do you? Absolutely. And, you know, it's going to end up poorly for the bears because then when, when bears, um, when we've trained them to, to come to people for food, uh, and they come to people and, and a problem's created, almost inevitably the bear ends up dead. You know, that's what they say. A fed bear is a dead bear. If they go from here to my neighbors and start trashing his place, looking for food, they're dead. But you don't want to say that. That would be terrible. The only, the only thing I can say to you is that in all the years I've been here, I don't believe I've lost a single bear to a, a neighbor. He's living on the edge. And you know, we had the famous incident here several years ago where another uh, bear whisperer, Timothy Treadwell, and uh, he finally pushed his luck too far. And he got killed. For once there is weakness, they will exploit it, they will take me out, they will decapitate me, they will chop me into bits and pieces. I'm dead. Timothy Treadwell was the self-proclaimed protector of grizzly bears. For 13 years, he shared their domain, but then he was eaten alive. What is the difference between what you're doing and what Timothy Treadwell tried to do? It's as different as night and day. I've come in here and 
and established my territory. And the bears know it's my territory. They're the ones that are coming to me. Timothy was living in the wilderness with totally unhabituated grizzly bears. You're saying he invaded their territory, whereas they're coming to yours. That's exactly what I'm saying. No. No. It's getting quite upset with me now. Should we move? She's not upset with you. <laughs> Bloody hope not. <laughs> Charlie Vandegar is without a doubt one of the most intriguing men I've ever met. He knows the outside world sees him as a maverick, whose walk on the wild side could cost his life. But that is a price that Charlie is willing to pay. Well... What do you want me to do? Say I want to die wearing a diaper in a nursing home? If I'm capable of having wonderful, exciting, happy days creating this place and playing with these bears, who's the winner? Am I like some sorry sucker having to work till he's 70 in an office? Is that living? No, I beg to differ with you. That's existing. I live out here. Every day is wonderful out here. Sorry for using your time to hear what you had to hear. I'll go to my grave feeling that Something's wrong. I try not to be a bad person. I sit here and I listen to uh, the prosecutor. It's his job to make me out as a bad person. Uh, I've had a I was given the freedom to incidentally buy the state to keep this land and to go out and live on it. And I've been very happy. It's taken a toll on my family, my wife. And I would like to thank the people that have come here to support me. I know it's been a huge embarrassment. And, and I can say this, but I think the most important thing I can say is, is that I've had a chance to live in a different environment. And I did never look at myself as a person who could go out and take a piece of land and then deny the creatures the right to be there. The first bear that came into me was welcomed with open arms. It was a, a happy moment for me. I, I wish that not involve so many other people. I have lots of friends that wanted to help me at their age because they love being there. I'd like to thank my attorney. An unexpected danger is definitely when you underestimate a moose. A moose is 
probably where more people get killed by than by bear. And the Alaska moose is the largest in the deer family. As you can see on the pictures, there's even road signs and in some areas they even number how many moose accidents that road had in that year. If you consider they are bigger than a horse, you don't really want to mess with, with them. They're not really keen to even get in trouble with us, but they just know how to fight better than we do. And if you come along a mom, you really should back up and try never um, get between the calves and the mom because she will stump you to death. But anyway, this is something which most people wouldn't have in their mind. And when people come to Alaska the first time, they're all scared of the bears, but no nobody ever thinks about the moose. It's not necessarily that the moose will attack you, but if they come run out of the forest and just right on the road and you get them on your windshield, you have no chance. Now we're getting into the wild and this is based on a true story with a tragic end and it happened in 1992. Chris McKentless was from the lower 48 and hitchhiked up to Alaska because he wanted to have an adventure in the wild, but he was not prepared for. For ignoring the rules of mother nature, he paid with the highest possible price, his life. 1996, a book was released into the wild and it's telling the story based on the diary he had written up to his own end. 2007, the movie caught a wider audience and the place of his death, the magic bus, became a pilgrimage de destination. People from all over the globe attend to retrace McKendler's steps. Many failed and have had to be rescued, and at least two died. Firefighters and Alaska State Troopers rescue hikers on the Stampede Trail every year. This is really the most stupid thing you can do. If you consider this is a hike of nine hours, you will definitely not make this in one day back and forth. So you have to be prepared because you will also have to cross rivers which might be very um, cold and high and it can kill you if you're not knowing what you're doing. So in the early um, year or in early summer when this is just starting to melt the water might be very low and you just walk through it but it can also happen that a day later, this is huge water level because of the melting and it's raining and it's you never know what to expect. So I would never do it in the first place. And because of all this, in June 2020, the decision was made to remove the bus in coordination with the Department of Natural Resources and it's mainly because of the concern of public safety. The guard said in his statement, in its current location near Healy, Alaska, the bus has drawn people into danger of the Alaska wilderness. Tragic ignorance or simply stupidity. Despite all warnings and the removal of the bus, the madness won't stop. Consider the concerns with the bears, possibly less humans get killed this way than by their own stupidity. The CNN headline said Alaska is into the wild bus known as the deadly tourist lure has been removed by air. But I tell you what, you can still find guide, guidings in the internet because people think they know better and they give advice to other people how to do the hike. And I think this is just insane. 
I have even seen comments where people were kind of complaining that the bus was removed because it's Chris's bus. But it's not, because the bus was there before. And I do not really understand why people... Yeah, I think it's all about just presenting themselves with a picture in on, on their social medias and say, yeah, I was there, I did it. But they encourage others to do the same and they may not make it. I would charge every single person that has to be rescued with the full cost of the firefighters or state troopers because it's... I just don't understand it. I, I, I will never understand it. Anyway, the worst is actually that this kid, Chris was 24 when, when this happened. If he would have prepared himself like with information that could have got him out of this situation, there is a cable running across the river with a like a bucket where you can sit yourself in the bucket and pull yourself over the river. That was maybe half a mile or not even a mile from where he tried to cross the river. Also, he was not aware that there is shelters where you can, um, well, find better, um, secure place with food and everything instead of just this bus because it got kind of colder in winter and yeah it's all about yourself if you're not prepared you risk your life the story of adventurer christopher mccandles has inspired people to find themselves in the wilderness for more than two decades but the wrecked bus made famous by the 1996 book and 2007 movie into the wild based on his life was airlifted from a remote trail outside Denali National Park in Alaska on Thursday. Alaska officials said that too many people were putting themselves at risk trekking to the remote site where McCandles died of starvation in 1992. Over the years, several people making pilgrimages to the bus became injured or stranded themselves. Two even died, drowned in river crossings. In April, a stranded Brazilian tourist was evacuated and in February, five Italian tourists were rescued. Local Mayor Clay Walker called the bus removal a big relief. The ultimate fate of the 1940s era bus is unknown. In a statement, the Department of Natural Resources said it is being kept in a secure location, pending a decision about its disposal. So talking about this, it's all about survival at the end. And there is a special division in the US military. They're called the Arctic Warriors. They have a handbook and even there, even it refers to winter, it can still even happen in summertime that you get caught by snow, especially where Chris was at, was kind of near the mountain range of where Dinelli Mountain is. And you can always expect sharp weather and you should be prepared for everything. He didn't even have a pair of rubber boots. He got it from the guy who he hitchhiked with. So you need to have the knowledge and you need to exactly know what you're doing. The minimum you ha should do for your own safety, tell someone what your plan is, where you're going, and when you're planning to come back. Because if you're overdue, this is what can save your life. Not even if you're on your own, in general. There are some really strange laws and other nice facts. Like, you cannot wake up a sleeping bear to take a selfie. You won't get in jail, but you will definitely get a fine, but that's only if you survive the selfie in the first place. In Fairbanks, due to a local tavern keeper kept getting his pet moose drunk, resulting in an animal going on drunken rampages. 
In order to stop these, it became illegal to give alcohol to a moose in Fairbanks. In Soldotna, attractive um, goodies are banned because everything which is attractive is attracting bears, including beef, fish, and piles of garbage, and so on. This ban has come into place in order to prevent dangerous encounters between humans and bears. Then we have about 3,000 rivers and 3 million lakes. Lakes and other bodies of water cover more than 14% of the state. The largest, Lake Il Iliaman, encompassing more than 2,600 square kilometers. The third longest river in the U.S. is the Yukon. It's about more than 3,000 kilometers long. There is an estimated number of 100,000 glaciers with about 29,000 square miles, or 5% of Alaska is being covered by them. The Bering Glacier in Alaska is the largest in North America. Tongass National Forest is the largest in the U.S. with 68,000 square kilometers. It is larger than West Virginia. There are more bald eagles in Chugach National Forest, the second largest national forest in the U.S., than all lower 48 states combined. The Northern Lights can be seen on average more than 200 days per year in Alaska. At the northern tip of Alaska, the sun doesn't rise at all for 67 days in winter, while in summer there is an 80-day stretch of non-stop sunlight. It's the northernmost community in America. One of the world's largest tides occurs in Turnagain Arm near Anchorage. The tide rises more than 10 meters. And note, the world's largest tides are in the Bay of Fundy between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. The lowest temperature ever recorded in Alaska was 62 below. That was in 1971 at Creek Camp. While the highest was 37.8 in Fort Yukon in 1915. Despite being one of the smallest state economies in the US, the per capita income in Alaska is one of the highest. Oil, natural gas, mining, and fishing dominate Alaska's economy, with tourism playing an interesting, increasing role. The Trans-Alaska Pipeline is one of the largest oil pipelines in the world, and it's capable of transporting more than 2 million barrels of oil per day. It usually operates well below capacity, too. Alaska is one of only nine U.S. states with no income tax. However, cities in Alaska do have sales tax. The cost of goods and the general cost of living are very high in Alaska, especially in rural areas due to their isolation and difficulty to access. Believe it or not, but there is 10,000 certified pilots, more than three times higher than the national average. Despite being the largest state, Alaska has the sixth lowest total number of miles of roads and highways. Regarding the flying, Alaska also has the most busiest and the largest float plane or sea base airport, which is near the international airport in Anchorage. So if you're there, go and have a look and watch the float planes taking off. It's nice, it's different. If you can afford it, go on one. It's a different experience. Alcohol is actually banned in many rural con 
communities in Alaska due to abuse. Along with Washington and Oregon, Alaska is one of the least religious states. The Alaska Independence Party, which favors the separation of Alaska from the U.S. as an independent country, has nearly 20,000 members. But you have to also bear in mind that Alaska is influenced, of course, by Washington, D.C., but on the other hand, if it comes to elections, they are the last state together with Hawaii where the votes are counted. So if the decision is already clear before, like um, they are not even counted, then also they get the restrictions. Um, Biden has just recently um, agreed that they can get for go for the natural natural gas, but um, for example, Obama, he did not agree that they're going to build a gas pipeline. So what are they going to live on? I mean, this is what their resources are. And another resource is giant vegetables. And they grow and grow because of all the sun during the summer. Midnight sun. So they even grow at midnight. Naturally, there is a state fair so that where farmers can show their giant vegetables and um, get their prices and records and whatnot. And here you see a cabbage, for example, which is more than 60 kilos. Now we're coming to my favorite, the big fish. The record of the largest king salmon ever caught in Alaska's Kenai River in 1985 is about 42 or 43 almost kilos. Nevertheless, my friend R.W. actually caught the second largest, also in the Kenai. But there's all kinds of, well, um, phrases and things people don't want to have on their boat, like bananas, because if you have bananas on board, you end up not catching fish because the fish god will say you have enough to eat already so it's bad luck bad weather and technical issues and no fish never get any bananas on board not even in your stomach at another time in the gulf of alaska my friend caught his biggest halibut was about 200 pounds and a lady at the marina asked how long did it take you to catch the fish? And he answers, my whole life. Some people look for a free ride. So my friend has a sign on the boat that says, this boat runs on gas, not on thanks. Fishy, fishy in the sea, come and bite my hook for me. All I can say is enjoy your fish, but no joke, there are hook doctors in Alaska that will help you to remove the hook from your face or any other place you may have got hit. This is what happens sometimes when you go fishing. The Iditarod is the world's largest sled dog race, takes place annually from Anchorage to Nome, a distance of 1,510 kilometers, Susan Butcher joined 16 times, holds the record as a female winning four times within five years and 15 times she'd been in the top 10. As you see, there is a northern route for even years and a southern route for odd years. And there have been years where the starting point had to be moved because there was no snow in Alaska. Then Susan has also had a total price money of 377k. Amazing. We're getting closer to the end of our journey and the things that are really hard to believe is that Alaska has a permanent fund and it is con 
institutionally established permanent fund management managed by the state-owned corporation, the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation. It was established 1976 from the state oil income with the annual lowest payout per head of $331 in 1984 and the highest being more than 2000 in 2015. Most people are actually get missed in Alaska. Per 100k population, there is 42 people missing. This is far more than any other state. I think the next one has 12 people missing per 100k population. But if you consider this is an enormous amount, on the other hand, there's the wild, there's always a risk people get lost. And if you look at this kid that went up there for his adventure, yeah, this is how it happens. And well, there is also the other thing that Alaska has the highest crime rate in violence and property crime. So it is not really considered a safe place, not just because of volcanoes and earthquakes. Another thing you need to be prepared if you ever go there, summertime is road construction time all over the state. Winter damages must be fixed within that short summer and work sometimes is 24 by seven. The inofficial state bird is actually the mosquito. Most annoying, more than 30 species, and some are really giants. If you get into a swarm, and the more north you go, the worse it's going to get. I don't know if you kind of get blood sucked until death. I have not heard of any cases, but I don't even want to think about it. Some other interesting facts are, everybody knows the reality shows we see in, on TV almost every day. They are about 30 and more about Alaska. And I think it became like an additional income source, but a lot of it is fake on the screen. So don't believe it. Most are far away from reality, like Alaskan bush people or the Alaska Daily is actually recorded in New Westminster, British Columbia. This is right in the neighborhood of Vancouver. So what does it have to do with Alaska? If you want to see something about real life in Alaska, there's a, um, a documentary or a show called Life Below, Life Below Zero or Mountain Man or Yukon Man. Whittier, a town that lives in one building, or a building in which an entire town lives. 200, about 218 population, 180 of them live in one building. Only since, 19, uh, only since June 20, 2000, Whittier is accessible by road. Before, it was only waterway, rail, or air. And on the rail, you could actually um, get your car on and take it home. The Whittier um, town actually only um, came up because it was military um, strategic, because there's mountains all around. So you're pretty kind of hidden and safe and secure. Another interesting um, <laughs> The thing is, Alaska has a long history with cannabis. It was decriminalized, criminalized, back and forth, and the last decision was made in 2014, and it's now kind of legalized for recreational.
Imagine strolling around your hometown without ever having to step outside. Lee Cowan found some townspeople with no need to imagine. Whittier, Alaska, about 60 miles from Anchorage, is both beautiful and yet gritty. It's wild, but tame. It's accessible, but also very remote. Yeah, it's a, you know, a strange little town because there's only one way in and one way out. It's not for everybody, right? No, it's, it's, it's not for everybody. The path to Whittier goes straight under a mountain into a tunnel bored through more than two miles of solid rock. And that tunnel shuts down at night, leaving Whittier cut off until morning. You know, you get to thinking, oh man, the tunnel's on the way out. What if there's an emergency or something and I can't get out? Yeah. But I've gotten used to it. He also had to get used to his address. Lee Shuford from North Carolina now lives on the 12th floor of what some describe as the Wilderness Tower. Now, a high rise does seem out of place here, but what's even more surprising is that the Begich Towers, as it's officially called, is about the only place to live in all of Whittier. People think it's weird. Yeah, it is known as the weirdest city in Alaska. Yeah. But is it? It really isn't. If I had one word, I would say it's magical. Just look at their view. Dave Dickison is Whittier's mayor. He, his wife Anna, and their 18-year-old daughter Janessa say they have almost everything they need right here. The Cozy Corner grocery store is stocked with essentials. There's a post office, a notary, even a church. All just an elevator ride away. We don't need all of the big box stores. We don't need all of the, the so-called conveniences of a large city. I feel like it's made us better people because it doesn't matter where you came from, how much money you have, you know, we're all just here in this town trying to make it work. That said, it's a hard place to have a social life. But There's not a lot of, you know, single people in their 20s and 30s here. Right. I mean, I don't know why. <laughs> what about uh, what about your social life? What's a social life like? Now that's that's probably a little troublesome. Uh, that, yep, that can that can be a little troublesome. And the dating question, nobody really dates here because we all grew up together, and that'd be kind of weird. <laughs> a few weeks ago, Janessa started posting about her life in the building on TikTok and soon had millions of views and just about as many questions. What are people asking the most? Um, I think the weirdest question that I got was like, is it a cult? <laughs> 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 it's like, no, it's not. Um, I got so many comments on my TikTok saying it looks sad, it looks depressing. And the community here just, it's so nice that you don't really ever feel sad and you always have someone to talk to. It was built by the military during the Cold War as a no-frills barracks. When the military left, the Alaska Railroad took over. It now owns almost all of the inhabitable land in Whittier. And no one's going to build a, a, a home on property that they don't own. About 300 or so residents live here year-round, many of them new families. The school, yes, there is one, it's connected to the building by, you guessed it, another tunnel. Currently has about 50 students, ages 3 to 18. It's important to be here for the right reasons. Lindsay Irk moved here from South Dakota to teach. No kid in this school can sit in the back of the classroom and not do something. They, every kid is seen. That's what fills my bucket, and that's why I want to stay. They do take care of their own here. Breakfast for the kids is often made by the teachers and during COVID is delivered right into the doorsteps of students like Yumi Alcantar. We're too small to function in isolation. You have to collaborate. You, you do and you have to be willing to work with each other. And what you can do is you're going to go straight down. Victor Shen also works with students here and he's also a graduate. He was born and raised in Whittier and came back because it's home. What don't people understand about Whittier? Uh, there's nothing to do here. Well, there's, everything's here. 
when we think of all those things that you value in a community, we found that here. It's, it's home. To some, it may just be the strangest town in Alaska, but for residents, Whittier seems to be the answer to the call of the wild. Oh, thank you. What do you want people to know about Whittier? I just want them to know that it's a unique, uh, beautiful place in its, in its own way. Before you judge the town of Whittier, you need to come visit it first. Another thing that will probably never end is that Russia, from time to time, plays the Alaska card, as we call it. It's about they want Alaska back, but you can see what the gov governor twitters. Good luck with that. I don't think this is ever going to happen, but they are still keep going with it. It's a threat, and hundreds of and thousands of armed Alaskans or the military members, they will see this differently. And realistically, there is not even the infrastructure on neither side to kind of move the military or any, um, any other vehicles or tanks or whatever you would need um, to kind of occupy a, a country or even think that you can cross it there because of course this is all monitored and Alaska has a very very high number of military up there for their protection and there is a channel called Voice of America that gives some answers like the Allison Air Base has the second longest runway in North America so they are prepared up there the bottom line is actually not the treaty from the 1867. It's all about the Arctic resources and the control. It would give the, the Russian side, in case they would really be on Alaska land, they could control the Northwest Passage and also the Bering Strait. And this is what this is all about. But anyway, let's hit the road and get back home as we soon reach the end of the, our journey. With the expansion of the tanker force at Isleson Air Force Base last year, Alaska has become one or the largest concentration of U.S. military forces. Alaska has long been lauded for its strategic relevance and the ability to reach nearly every geopolitical flashpoint in the world. As the importance of the Arctic increases, how do you plan to advocate for Alaska's role in national security? <clears throat> yeah, Alaska has always played an outsized role in America's national security. It's because of our strategic location. We are the air crossroads of the world, and we have to make sure that our bases are well-equipped, that they're well-funded, and that they're fully staffed. Uh, <laughs> When it comes to Arctic resources, for instance, what has been happening in our country for years is kind of this ignorance of what other countries are doing in claiming Arctic resources that belong to us, to our people. Um, Russia, they've been literally physically undersea flagging areas where they're claiming resources that again, they belong to us. And our administrations, present and past, have kind of ignored the issue. I believe that Alaska's delegation has tried to bring it to light and let people understand how important it is that we become aggressive. Again, these are national security issues. Aggressive in securing our national resources that um, other countries are thinking that they're gonna claim. Um, Alaska has got to be even more vocal, more prominent in this fight uh, in, in order to put Alaska even brighter on the map when it comes to national security issues. And yeah, I get mocked for saying that you can see Russia from Alaska. Well, you can. In the mid-80s, remember Lynn Cox? She swam between two, Alaska, America, and Russia. So I'll take one for the team. I'll keep getting mocked for that, you guys. But we know how important Alaska is because of our strategic location. Nick Begich, what else can you do to advocate for Alaska's role in national security? 
Well, I think that as we see a militarization of the Arctic, particularly within uh, Russia, we see a, a, a large presence established there. A number of uh, former Soviet Union military installations have been reactivated in Russia. We see a, a tremendous investment by both Russia and China uh, in terms of icebreakers to control and manage shipping routes that go right by our coastline. I think it's critical that if we are going to regain leadership in the Arctic, we make incremental investments, not just in our uh, military uh, presence in the state of Alaska, but also in our, <laughs> also in our, um, in, I'm sorry, that threw me off a little bit, uh, but, but also uh, in our hard infrastructure. Because if you're going to maintain uh, a state this large, uh, you're going to have to do so by having a population and a hard infrastructure that allows you to access the state, to have a robust economy within the state that uh, permits you to hold the land. We are the least densely populated state in the country, and we need economic growth in order to maintain our hold on Alaska over the long term. So let me thank you again for traveling with Ela Air. We hope you had some unexpected moments. We now prepare for landing at Frankfurt Airport. So please return to your seat, fasten seat belt and bring your seat in an upright position. The local time is 9.21 p.m. and the temperature at Frankfurt Airport is 21 degrees. Never forget to expect the unexpected.